Okay, Fred, whenever you're ready. Ready, Lindsay? Yeah, I didn't hear back from them, but. Okay, Fred, whenever you're ready. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, why don't we just wait a few minutes? Uh, people are still coming into the chat. Just wait a minute for a few more people to come into the chat. I think we should be all set, Lindsay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to bring a really great speaker to all of you today on behalf of Baruch College, the Zicklin School of Business in the City University of New York. Uh, we have an hour chat plan with Lindsay Pollock, who is a great dear friend of CUNY and Baruch and is a nationally known New York Times bestseller, as well as a leading spokesperson for generations in the workplace and a very dear friend of mine. So I'm going to hand it over to Lindsay. We'd like you to show yourself on video for the program. We're going to keep everybody on mute. So please feel free to use the chat feature on Zoom. If you're unable to get into Zoom, you can chat on the GCMC Facebook page and we will allow some time at the end of the program for questions. And Lindsay will stay on for 30 minutes after the program to answer any further questions from students. So I'm gonna hand over to Lindsay. Thank you very much. We're delighted to have you here today. Thank you so much, Fred and Lindsay, and thank you to everyone for joining today. I am here with you in New York City on the Upper West Side and have been in New York for over 20 years, so I am so delighted to support CUNY and all of you. And again, thank you, Fred, for inviting me to do this. Um, we are going to talk about getting from college to career, obviously, super specifically during the coronavirus crisis. And I want to start by saying that I I found myself job hunting right after 9-11 here in New York. So while I'm not in your specific situation, I do have some very personal experience job hunting during a challenging time. And I want to acknowledge first and foremost that this totally stinks. And it is really awful that you have to go through this challenging situation. What I wanna say on the positive side is the one thing that you can control is the approach you take during this process. So while the situation is awful and unfair and terrible and difficult, there are a tremendous number of things that you can do to still find a job and advance your career right now. And I really wanna share all of the people and resources that want to help you. And I include myself in that, both from my personal experience of such gratitude to the people and organizations that supported me after 9-11, and also to say that many of us who have businesses or are employed or work in career services, um, as so many of you know through your work with CUNY, we're all here to help. And I wanna make sure you take advantage of of all of that. 
I am going to make the slide deck from today available to all of you. So you'll receive that after today. And as Fred mentioned, I'll break a couple of times during this webinar to answer your specific questions. I'll also spend a lot of time at the end answering your questions. I also wanted to invite all of you, if you're interested, to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. I will tell you a little bit later the best way to format those questions so that you'll get the response that you want, but please feel free to connect with me. I also served for six years as an ambassador for LinkedIn, so I have a lot of knowledge of the specifics of using that website, and I know that your career centers have expertise in that as well. So I added in this slide to invite you to connect with me. I also added this slide because I had a really good hair day the day of that photo being taken. I had professional hair and makeup and uh, I just wanted to point out that my eight-year-old did my hair this morning so it's not quite as good of a look but it's always fun to see what things can look like on a better day. I'm sure a lot of you relate to that so please feel free to connect. All right let's start with some key themes to keep in mind and again this stinks, it's a terrible situation, but your mindset is tremendously important right now and that is in your control. So three mm -hmm. overarching themes to keep in mind for this particular time. Number one, be proactive, do not be paralyzed. Yes, this is difficult. But when you look back on this time, this quarantine, this time of social distancing, whether you are out working in an essential job while you job hunt, whether you have a family to take care of, do not let yourself get overwhelmed by how hard this is. When you think back a year from now or 10 years from now, what did you do during this time? I want you to feel like you took every action you could to be successful. So think about your future self and what your future self will have wanted you to do during this time. Take action and I'll give you lots of ways to do that today. Number two is you're going to have to be creative. This is not a time to hold out for your dream job. I promise you that any job can be a really good starting point or continuation to your career. Every role that you have, even if it's flipping burgers, is going to teach you something that will help you later in your career. So I'm going to talk about how you can cast the widest net possible with the potential jobs and employers that you reach out to. This is not a time to be precious and wait for the perfect opportunity. This is about being really flexible right now. And finally, on that note, we're gonna have to be practical. You might not necessarily be able to get the exact job at the exact company you want, but part of being active and proactive right now is to find where the jobs are. So learning how to do that research is gonna be really essential. I have every belief that you can transition from where you start to anywhere you want to get to but right now you're going to have to think about who is actually hiring and how you can position yourself for those responsibilities uh, the other key theme is that i staged my background today and i wanted to admit to you that the flowers over my shoulder are fake so if anyone is really uh, admiring those flowers i wanted you to know they were seven dollars on amazon and they are fake okay Moving on, I'm gonna give you 10 tips to think about. And I, I picture all of you with like a toolkit. And I wanna just throw lots and lots of tools into that toolkit. Some may work better for some of you than others. Some might make sense in two weeks instead of now, but I wanna put it all in your toolkit. So here's tool number one of 10. Take action every single day toward your job search. One of the mistakes I made when I was job hunting after 9-11 is that I was not taking enough action. Quantity really matters here. You're gonna to have to apply for a lot of jobs. You're gonna to have to talk to a lot of people. Now, self-care is super important. If you need a break, of course, take one. If you need a day to just veg and relax, take it. But for the most part, I want you to think about taking action every day. And here are some examples of what that means. Where can you improve a skill? There are so many free webinars and podcasts and books and e-courses right now. If you know 
that there is a skill that you should be improving or that you've always thought, oh, I should be a little better of a public speaker or my grammar could use a little bit of help or I know I'm a little weak on my Excel skills. Now is a really good time to make progress on that. Also, so many websites like LinkedIn Learning, Coursera, Masterclass, TED Talks are offering courses and classes and tutorials totally for free right now because of the crisis. Take advantage of any skill that you can improve right now, even if it's reading a five minute blog post on a skill you know you want to improve. That will also be a good story to tell employers when they interview you. Well, how did you use this time? What have you been up to? Well, I was improving my skills. Another action you can take is to offer to do project work for a family business, a friend's business, any employer that you've interned with or worked for in the past or your university or professors you know, any professional grade work, writing an article, helping somebody analyze some data, making some customer service phone calls, anywhere that you can offer a little bit of project work is gonna be another valuable use of your time that could transition into full-time work maybe when things turn around. Another action you can take that has value is to offer your time to a nonprofit, whether it is writing emails or sending out thank you notes. Any nonprofits or charities that you work with or are interested in are very much seeking help and work right now. So that's another way to keep your skills sharp, show yourself, and possibly meet new people who will lead you to a job. And if possible at all, some of you are still doing essential work. Some of you are uh, still working in retail stores or in the healthcare industry or childcare. Absolutely continue to do that. That's an incredibly valuable use of your time during this pandemic. Anyone uh, want to share something else that you're doing right now to keep your skills sharp and keep your job search going? Lindsay or Fred, if you can see anyone, type in ideas. I also think this webinar and any class or course that you're taking is a way to share ideas. So does anyone have another action that you're taking during this time that is proving valuable for your job search? Lindsay, Fred, anything come in? We'd ask people when they chat to please use chat to everyone so the chat sh shows up in the feed. And Lindsay Plua is also on helping matter to the chats, who's the deputy director of our office as well. I forgot to introduce her at the beginning. So we have Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so it looks like in the chat, um, one person suggested that Harvard is offering more than 60 free classes. Uh, Emerson suggested uh, volunteering. And Adam um, suggested uh, political organizing, um, mm -hmm. not necessarily through a nonprofit. Um, but grassroots mutual aid networks and Adeza suggested uh, Udemy um, for coursework. And finally, uh, Jack said, keep connecting to people virtually and invest in your relationships. Great, really good examples. Every one of those actions can lead you to meet somebody who could know about a job, could lead you to do work that you could show an employer. So all those are terrific and we will definitely be talking about networking a little bit later on. Thank you, Lindsay, for those. So use this time wisely, do not be paralyzed. Tip number two of 10 is to start what I call a really big list. You can do this on a piece of paper, you can do this on your phone, on a document. I want you to brainstorm as wide a list as possible of every potential idea you have for finding a job right now. By the way, this is my first tip in any job search environment, but I think it's particularly important right now. So what are the industries that are even remotely interesting to you or possibilities for you to work? Who are all of the employers that you would ever consider or think about? Job functions, let's say your dream was to be a journalist, to work in the media. Well, that might not happen right now. So if you know that you are a good writer, that could mean being a reporter. That could mean working in public relations. That could be marketing. That could be internal communications. That could be grant writing for a nonprofit. That could be teaching English at any level uh, from kindergarten through college. So think about the job you want, and then what are all of the other possibilities around that? 
What people do you know? Think about your friends, your family, your neighbors, your professors, your high school teachers, your career services staff, administrators, neighbors, people from uh, religious organizations, political connections. Think about a very, very long list. And for every item on that list, start to get creative. Well. I said public relations, that could lead to marketing. Marketing could lead to data analysis. Data analysis could lead to strategy, could lead to consulting. So really get creative. And we're gonna use this list throughout the webinar to start to build ideas that you can have. And again, I want you to start with what you're genuinely interested in because it is a very big mistake to ever say, I'll take anything. And the reason you don't want to say, I'll take anything, is it doesn't give people anything to work with. So if I say to you, Fred, I would love to help you with your job search. What are you looking for? And you say, I'll take anything. I can't do anything with that. But if you narrow anything to even 17 things, now I can start to think about who I know and the opportunities I know. So I know that you're not gonna take anything because you probably don't wanna be an orthodontist or an opera singer or whatever it is. So you have to at least give me something to work with. This really big list will help you in your networking and in your searches for jobs and in your meetings with career services people to at least have a starting point. Number three, once you have your list, is to now compare it to a list of what is actually possible right now. So you have to do some homework on who is actually hiring. How can you find those lists? Your career center, whatever CUNY school you go to or went to, and if you're in graduate school or business school where you went undergrad, they still have job postings. I was just talking to Fred and Lindsay at Zicklin, who's hiring? What are the categories of people who are hiring? So number one, go to your career center website or set up an appointment with the staff. Number two are social media sites, particularly LinkedIn and Twitter. And I just did a screenshot of LinkedIn, which is using the hashtag hiring now, which is also a hashtag on Twitter of the companies that are hiring. Now you might look at this list and say, well, it's mostly grocery stores. I don't want to bag groceries, but remember, Instacart, Amazon, Walmart, they have marketing people, they have accounts payable people, they have IT professionals. So just because a company is in the industry of let's say groceries or healthcare, they still have jobs that could be a fit for your skills. So when I see that Ace Hardware is hiring 30,000 people, I have no idea how to use hardware, but maybe they need a marketing writer and that's something that I could do. So look who is hiring and now add some of these companies to your really big list and you can use that in your networking as we'll talk about. Startups are still very much hiring them. Many are backed by venture capital and have money in the bank and are hiring. There are specific websites that you can Google startup hiring that are still employing people. Professional associations, rather than looking on the huge hundreds of millions of people on LinkedIn, you can go to a professional association in accounting or marketing or engineering and look up jobs there. There are other niche job boards for uh, people of color, for women, for people in a particular city or state. So Google and find out where those smaller opportunities are. And that includes local newspapers and local job sites like Craigslist. Not everybody is going to go to Monster and LinkedIn, right? Make sure that if you are job hunting on one website, I want you to now expand that to 10 websites where you are actually seeing opportunities. So yes, networking is the best way to find a job, but it doesn't mean you don't look for jobs on websites at all. They are still an opportunity. And when you see job postings for jobs that are available right now, that is also going to give you information for how to update your resume and LinkedIn. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So when you see job postings, I want you to apply, but do not have a generic one size fits all resume. Even if you never get any of the jobs you apply for on LinkedIn, you can use the keywords in those job listings to enhance your resume. So if you find 10 jobs on LinkedIn that you think are appealing, 
and you see the same keywords used in those job postings, I want you to now incorporate those keywords into your resume. So if you see the word team player, if you see the word reliable, if you're a writer and you see the word persuasive in more than one job posting, I want you to now take that word and start to add it to your resume. So looking at jobs is not just to apply and get the job, it's also research on what your resume should be selling that people are hiring now. I also wanna make sure that every time you submit a resume, or an application on LinkedIn, that you are customizing it to that particular job or employer. Uh, in IRL, in real life, in uh, the old school way, I remember in the 90s going to job fairs. One was at the Javits Center, the big CUNY Big Apple job fair. And I would have separate colored folders for jobs in different industries because I had a paper resume. That's why I want you to think. If you're gonna apply for jobs in public relations, nonprofit grant writing and teaching, you're going to have to have a slightly different resume for each of those opportunities so that they fit the job that you're applying for. You're all going to see those articles where somebody says, I sent out a thousand resumes and I didn't get one interview. If you send out a thousand identical generic resumes, you're not going to get an interview because nobody wants a generic resume. So every time you apply for a job, customize your resume just a little bit with some of the keywords from that job or about that company. And your career center, of course, can help you with this. And that's the last tip, is that you have this amazing free resource in the career centers at all of the CUNY schools that can help you specifically improve your resume. Do not waste that free opportunity to get a better resume by working with your career center. In the real world, when you're not a student, resume writers are really expensive. So use the resources you have to get your resume to be improved. Fred and Lindsay, I hope that you get bombarded with requests to do that because that is something I wish I had been able to take advantage of. Now, once you've thought about your resume, which is a critical tool in the job search, you can't job hunt without a resume, I also want you to think about your LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn is important, not just for job hunting, but every recruiter now, every hiring manager, every networking connection is probably gonna look you up on LinkedIn if you reach out. So the importance of LinkedIn is it's this one place on the web where you can put your stake in the ground and say, this is how I want you to think of me as a professional. Now you can't have different LinkedIn profiles for different jobs because you can only have one profile, but you can include keywords in LinkedIn that show that you are professional. A couple tips, and I just pulled this from the official LinkedIn guide for students, have a professional headshot. You can do this now during lockdown, get a friend or a family member or take a selfie. But what's important is that in the photo, you dress the way you would for a job interview in your industry. So if you wanna get a job in finance or accounting or something corporate, you should be wearing a suit. If you wanna work in an art gallery or with children, you can dress a little bit differently, but that is how I would dress. Also think about your headline. Here you can see in David's profile, econ major and aspiring financial analyst. It says what he's doing now and what he wants to do. Don't make people guess what you want. Tell them directly. And I know I told you to cast a wide net. You can use a more general term. Instead of aspiring financial analyst, you can be a little bit more general and say aspiring financial services professional if you don't want to limit yourself in your headline. I would have used the full word economics, but I think having your major or your specialty in there is really valuable. Don't put something generic like student because that headline is gonna be important when people check you out for the first time. I'm gonna talk about your summary statement in a moment, but I did wanna to touch on experience and organizations. As a student, you can absolutely put unpaid internships, volunteer work, and activities in your experience section. The difference is between experience and organizations, I would put unpaid, nonprofit, organization, extracurricular work and experience if you had a leadership role in that work. So if you were president of the accounting fraternity, put it in experience. 
If you're a member of the accounting fraternity, put it in organizations. But people know students don't have 25 years of paid experience. It is okay to list your experience in the uh, list your nonprofit or unpaid experience in that section. Certainly, internships can go there. And one more topic before I break for some questions. I recommend that you write your LinkedIn summary. That's this uh, area here under background, kind of like your bio. I would write it like a cover letter when you're job hunting. And here's an example of how to do that in a broader way during the crisis. I'm a marketing major at the Brew College Zicklin School of Business. I've worked in retail as an associate, interned at a public relations agency, and volunteered as an English tutor. I'm seeking a role in marketing, public relations, or communications. I'm a strong writer, highly organized, and eager to support an organization in any way. This is focused on someone who has good writing skills and is organized, but it is broad enough that people know that you would be willing to consider multiple opportunities. So with that, Fred, Lindsay, I'd love to break for a couple questions, ideally related to resumes, LinkedIn profiles, and just general themes on job searching. Anything on networking, let's hold because that's gonna be our next topic. Just wanna remind students, Lindsay, that we're happy to review those LinkedIn summaries, just like we review a resume and cover letter. So students are welcome to come to Career Services and have us review their LinkedIn profile, review their summaries, and go over the strategy you just laid out here for a good marketing summary. Um, for sure. And also, um, we did get a question come in uh, uh, regarding resumes from Ariel. Uh, Ariel asks, can you use different resumes even if you're applying to different positions at the same company? Or if Great it's question. the same company, do you recommend using one resume? Lindsay, what's your perspective from uh, career services? And then I'll answer uh, with my opinion. Sure. Um, so my perspective is if you are applying to the same company and you have multiple resumes, it appears that you don't know what you want to do. <laughs> So it appears that you're a bit disorganized. So within the same company, my suggestion would be to get more information, find out more about those different positions and different opportunities, and then hone in on the one that you really want and go after that. Yeah, um, thank you, Ariel, for the question. Um, especially at a big organization, your resume is probably going to be in some sort of applicant tracking system, which is really a computer. And so if they have two resumes, it's going to confuse the computer. It's going to confuse the people. So it can be really hard to do that at a large company. That said, at a smaller business or a startup, or if you have a friend at the company, I think you can submit one resume to the formal system and then say, uh, hey, Lindsay, I know that you work in the marketing team. I'd love for you to pass my resume to your boss. I customized it a little bit for your job. And you could email it to the person. What you don't ever want to do is send different resumes to one of those formal systems or apply for multiple jobs on LinkedIn at the same company with different resumes. So I think if you're going the personal route to an individual you know personally and emailing them a resume, it could be a little bit customized for a role. But if you're applying online, I would keep it the same so as not to confuse the system. Great question, Ariel. Thank you for that. Any other questions at this point? Um, we have a question about your LinkedIn headshot. Um, what type of background would you recommend? So again, what you want to wear is what you would wear for a job interview. And I think your background should reflect the professionalism of your industry. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you want to be as simple and plain as possible because I don't want anything to be more important than you. So if you're standing in like a beautiful garden in Prospect Park, that's great. But now I'm noticing the flowers and I'm not noticing you. So I would say a simple wall, a simple professional background is going to be effective. Now, if you know that you are in a very particular field. And unfortunately, I don't think that's a good idea right now, but let's say you knew you wanted to work in art, maybe I would take a picture with a little bit more of an artsy background because that's very specific to what you want. But I think the safest move right now is to have a very simple background. Also, LinkedIn allows you that sort of uh, larger box behind you, like a background image. I would keep that the generic LinkedIn blue 
I would just keep things very professional, very simple, very general, because you're going to want to cast a wide net right now. I know sometimes people like to put a pretty picture of foliage or a nice building. I think that sometimes takes away from you as a professional. All I want them to see is that you can take a professional shot. I do think what matters is light. You don't want to look dark. Um, or look like you don't know how to use a camera properly. So the one advantage of taking it outside, maybe in front of a building wall, is that you'll get better light. So I think I would go with a plain wall in your home if you have good light, or outside in front of a plain wall so that you can get a little bit better lighting. But the simpler, the better. Great. Uh, one other question on LinkedIn um, or about LinkedIn. How would you recommend formatting a LinkedIn profile for someone switching industries? Um, for example, I've been a restaurant manager for a few years, but I'm an international studies economics major, and I'm looking to transition to, um, I'm looking to start transitioning my work experience. Great. So I'm going to go back to uh, the LinkedIn profile example. What I would do here is two things. Number one, that headline is really important. So what I would put is what you want first but an acknowledgement of your background second. So in that example, I would say international business professional or international relations professional slash, I'm a big fan of slashes or uh, vertical lines or some kind of marker, international business professional slash hospitality background or hospitality experience. So it shows that you have more than one skill and that you are in the transition. So that's your headline. As the first sentence of your summary, I would first say what you want. I am a Zicklin MBA seeking a position in international business finance or consulting, whatever it is you want. I have a background of five years in working in the hospitality and restaurant industry. So always lead with what you want and then explain that you have done something else in the past. Nobody will be surprised right now that you're making a transition. Nobody will be surprised that you're willing to consider a lot, but always start with what you want, not with what you're transitioning out of. Um, and one more question uh, from Fernanda. Fernanda says, um, I have a great background in my home country in the law field. Uh, is this important in my resume to find a job here in the U.S.? Hi, Fernanda. Absolutely. Absolutely. Use what you've got. Show what you did. Be proud of it. Don't apologize for it. Talk about it as if it's totally relevant. Employers are going to read your energy and read your confidence about the skills you bring. So if you come in and say, yes, I have 10 years of experience in law in my home country. Here is how it's applicable to uh, this organization, great. If you say, oh, I kind of worked in law in the past. I don't know if it really counts here. Then they're not going to trust you. So your confidence with it is important. I would absolutely sell it. Doesn't matter where that experience came from. Now, if you don't have the relevant degree here to practice law or to be a professional, that might be something that you need to work on. But the confidence of your experience absolutely counts here. Uh, great, thank you. Um, so right. Sarah's asking, as a part-time MBA student, um, unfortunately facing job loss uh, due to health crises as she's working in the live event industry. Um, she's been working professionally for 12 years. Um, and her question is, uh, should I consider taking an internship to get into a new field? I am so sorry that you're experiencing this. I also work in the live event industry and it stinks. My answer is yes. I would consider everything, but I don't want you to think either or. I would consider internships and continue to look for paid full-time, part-time work, contract work, absolutely anything you can get, whether it's working on virtual events, whether some smaller events start to happen again, I would consider everything and not limit yourself. But if you consider internships, don't stop applying for paid full-time and part-time work as well. Okay. I'll keep going and then we'll stop for uh, additional questions. Those are great. Keep them coming. I really appreciate all of your specific questions. So sixth of our 10 tips is to stand out in this environment by doing your research. It is no secret that millions of people are job hunting right now and millions of students 
How do you stand out when there are so many people? Number one, don't think about everybody else. Don't worry about who else is applying. You can't control that. What you can control is showing employers how much you are willing to work to get these jobs. Now, the place that I suggest you do that might be surprising, but I think that social media and Twitter in particular are incredibly valuable research tools for you to not just find job opportunities, but when you apply for something to stand out from everybody else who's generically applying. This is about being specific. So even the founder of Twitter, Ev Williams, has said Twitter is really a news system. It's not just a social network. So think of Twitter as a bit of a personal news feed to support your job search. So for example, I just picked management consulting. If you want a job in management consulting as one of the fields you're considering, I would go in, you can either do this if you already have a Twitter feed or you can create a new one or create a new list. This is not about tweeting out. This is just about getting information in. So I would follow any management consulting firm that you've ever heard of. So I just did Boston Consulting Group, Bain, McKinsey, et cetera. Now, once you start to follow these, you're gonna see them tweet out jobs. You're gonna see them mention issues in the industry. Then maybe they're gonna mention another company they work with. Follow that company, that could be a potential employer. They're gonna mention their CEO follow their CEO who might mention other companies, which might be opportunities for you. It's another way to build your really big list by seeing who the companies you've heard of are talking about. Frankly, I think most of you are gonna end up getting jobs at organizations you have not heard of today, April 29th, 2020. You know this many companies. You're gonna to have to expand your universe of what you know, and Twitter is a good way to do that. You can also do this on LinkedIn. I think Twitter is somewhat easier, but companies are putting out information on LinkedIn as well if you want to just stay in that LinkedIn ecosystem. So I would create a feed of companies, individuals, industries, uh, professional associations, anything you can think of related to your job. So essentially take your really big list, translate it into a social media feed. Here's why. Number one, it will give you reasons to reach out to people in your network. It's one thing to say, hey, John, I'm looking for a job. Hope you're doing well. It's another to say, hey, John, I've been following your company on Twitter. I saw that you're hiring and that you're doing some really interesting stuff during the COVID crisis. I'd love to connect with you. It gives you hooks to talk to people and reconnect without being generic. Number two, as I mentioned, it gives you new people and organizations to expand your really big list. It will help you learn about all of the organizations that are out there in a really easy way. You can't just go into Google and type in uh, what companies hire writers. But if you know 10 companies that do and you follow them on social media, you're gonna hear mention of all the others. So it's a really, really good research and investigative tool. It'll help you better reach out to your career services department, to your professors, to say, I was reading about this company um, that's doing medical devices. I know that you mentioned that in class. Do you know anybody at that company? So it gives you more ideas to connect with the people at your university who are here to help you. And finally, it builds your confidence and your depth of knowledge. So if you apply to a job in banking and they interview you and they say, well, why did you apply for this job? You'll know more about why that company is different from their competitors because you've been following them on social media. If you apply to a startup and you've been following that startup on social media for three weeks, you're not going to say, well, I read about your company and it looks like a good place to work. You can say, I was reading about your three new product offerings and what you're doing to help people on the front lines during this crisis. I was really impressed by that. Now you're not a generic applicant. You are somebody who is rising above everybody else to say that you are somebody who does your homework. You are somebody who is prepared. You are somebody who isn't just scattering tons of resumes to the wind, but you are doing work to understand the organizations that you apply for. One of the gifts of this time, if you're unemployed, is you probably have a little bit more time. And if you have more time, you can spend it going down these little rabbit holes of research. I can't recommend this enough. I recommend it in good times, but I think in challenging times, this is even more important because so many people are, are gonna apply for jobs with no knowledge of the company. If you know 
who the company is, what they do, and you can speak intelligently about that, you are gonna end up in a totally different category from all of the other job applicants. Here's what else will put you in a different category, and that is your network. And I know so many students or first generation Americans or people who haven't been in New York for a while say, well, I don't really know anybody. That is not true. Everybody has a network. You have to think really broadly. Your network includes your family, your friends, your professors, your advisors, your neighbors, the people you go to religious services with, the people that you walk past on your corner, the person at the dry cleaner. I know we are not seeing people in person right now, but your network is significantly bigger than you think. Just look at the number of contacts in your cell phone. And that is one example of how big your network is. The mistake is we don't think about those people as professional connections because we never ask them who they know or what employers they know. You have no idea who the people in your network are connected to until you actually ask the question. So just as you would say to somebody, where do you get your hair cut? Or where did you get that shirt? Or where are you getting your coffee this afternoon? I would start to ask people, do you know anybody at these companies? Do you know anybody who works at XYZ organization? Because nothing is more powerful in a job hunt in good times, but especially in difficult times than having a human being forward your resume to that company. And I wanna give you a visual example of this. I had a recruiter say to me, I have two stacks of resumes on my desk at all times. I have this really, really, really tall stack of resumes that come in from the internet, from LinkedIn, from job sites, from our own website. And then I have a tiny little stack of resumes that are sent to me by people I know and trust. Which stack do you wanna be in? You wanna be in the little baby stack. You wanna be in the stack where some human has recommended you. That could be the custodian at the bank. That could be a college friend of a friend of the recruiter. It doesn't matter who it is. It's just a human being vouching for you. So do not be shy about asking people to recommend you and forward your resume to companies. So how do you do that? I wanna give you a template that you can use to personalize and customize to ask people for advice. Now, I would never immediately reach out to somebody and say, can you get me a job? Or can you forward my resume? The first thing you want to do is ask for help. And here's how I would do it. And I'll tell you why I do it this way. And you can do this by email. You can do this on LinkedIn. You can do this by text. You can do this by phone call. Hi, Susan. I came across your information on LinkedIn, and I'm impressed by your career path as a fellow Baruch alum. So here, the only connection I have with the person is that we went to the same college. I'm graduating this spring from my MBA program and looking for a job in this challenging environment. Everybody knows it's tough. You don't have to hide it. Would you be willing to share some advice with me? You're not asking for a job. You're just asking for advice, perhaps with a 15 minute phone call or a few email questions. Subtext here is I'm not going to take hours of your time. I would be so grateful for your time and support. If you do this every day, once a day, one person a day, you will start to tap into what they call this hidden job network, which is being in that small stack. I also want to tell you that anybody who can be helpful right now wants to be helpful. Do not be embarrassed or shy about asking people for help. The number one search on Google right now is how can I help? So know that when you reach out to people you are not bothering them and if they can't respond they won't if they are sick if they have a sick loved one of course they won't respond and that's okay this is why you have to send a lot of these kinds of messages but don't hesitate to ask people for help now if somebody says yes i want you to be really specific in your request and this is my suggestion to you if you reach out to me if you reach out to someone through career services or in your network do not say help or can you get me a job? Be specific. And here are some ways to be specific. Look at somebody's LinkedIn profile before you reach out. Find out where they've worked, where they went to school, who they know. If you reach out to me and say, Lindsay, I saw that you used to work for a women's business nonprofit. That's what I'm interested in. Now, number one, I know that you've done your homework on me, so you're not going to waste my time. And number two, I actually can 
help you. But don't get on the phone and say, where did you go to college? Because you're wasting their time with something you could have figured out on LinkedIn. So number one, before you speak to somebody, find out where those connections and opportunities are. Next, share information from your really big list. Um, hey, John, I would love to run a couple of company names past you. Do you know anybody at these organizations? Now, let's say you say Citigroup, Credit Suisse, and Wells Fargo. Well, those are all banks. If I don't know somebody at those, but I do know somebody at Barclays Bank, I'm still going to mention it because I understand that you're looking at banks. So you have to spark my thinking with what you want and your really big list is a way to do that. Now, if you're struggling to be creative, you can say, Lindsay, I've thought of banking, I've thought of accounting. Do you have any other ideas? And I might say, what about private equity? Uh, what about personal financial advising? So you can also use people as a way to lengthen your really big list. I would also be ready before you reach out with a pre-written paragraph about yourself. So let's say best case scenario, the person says, oh my gosh, I actually know someone who's hiring. Send me information on yourself and I'll forward it right to my friend who's hiring. You wanna be ready for that possibility. And you can take that right from your LinkedIn summary statement, which you should have your career center vet that says, this is who I am, this is what I can do. So don't say, oh my gosh, I'll put that together and take three days have that ready to go before you reach out. And finally, another way, and I recommend this in all scenarios, not just in challenging times, the best way to use networking is to be really specific in asking people for what I call assignments or actions. So this is how you avoid somebody saying, oh, you know, I, I feel really bad for you. It's so rough out there. Keep it up. You're doing great. It's gonna be okay. That is not helpful. But if you say, can you give me a book to read or a class to take or a company to research, that has two benefits. Number one, it gives you a really tactical action to take, which will help you, but it also gives you a really specific reason to follow up with that person and to say, thank you for recommending that I take that Udemy class. I took it. Here was the value I got. Thank you for that recommendation. Now you're also showing that person that you are the kind of student who takes action. Now they're impressed by you. And now when they do recommend you to people or jobs they know, they have some data about how amazing and hardworking a person you are. So don't be afraid to say, can you give me a specific task? Can you give me a specific assignment? Go do it and report back. Could be employers to research, could be people to contact, it could be resources to check out. Which leads to the ninth tip, and then we'll wrap up with the 10th and go to Q&A. I know you're going to be asking for help right now. I know it's hard to be the one needing help, and so many people need help right now. All anybody ever wants in return is you to say thank you. So, if you're reaching out to a lot of people, if you're asking for help, if you want advice, all you ever have to do to be worthy of that advice and to make the other person feel valued it is, is to say in an email or a handwritten note or a text, thank you so much. Your help was really meaningful to me. Make sure that you thank anyone and everyone who helps you right now that is what people want, and that will ensure that you have good karma and good positive feelings from the people who are supporting you. So be generous in your gratitude. And the last tip is you have to bring the positivity right now to this situation. Because you're a job seeker, because you're the person seeking help, as crummy as you might feel, and all of us are feeling crummy at some point right now, I have personally eaten my body weight in peanut M&Ms on a daily basis. When you are job hunting, you have to stay positive. Do not complain to employers. Do not complain to networking contacts. Do not say how unfair it is, even though it is unfair. Make sure that you say, I want to contribute right now. I want to get going. I want to help a company survive this. I want to give my skills to support you. I can't wait to get started. Even if it's a job you didn't even think you wanted six months ago, that positivity and passion and enthusiasm is what you as a new employee can bring to the table. So cry on the inside, complain to your friends and family, but when you're in the job hunt, your positivity and enthusiasm are incredibly important to this process. 
So we're going to break for q and I'll take as many as you have, but I did want to share two free resources for you that I wanted to offer. Number one, I have a podcast, The Work Remix, which you can get wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I'm, of course, doing a special coronavirus series, so please check out my podcast. I also created a list of resources, books, articles, everything I find valuable in job hunting and career development. If you take out your phone, and this works in the US only, if anyone's dialing from outside of the US, this won't work, you can reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, but take out your phone, type my name as the message, Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, just like Lindsay Plua at Baruch. 66866 and you will get that message. That will also provide you with my direct email address and I welcome your questions. So I wanna thank Fred Burke, Lindsay Plua, everybody at Baruch Zicklin, everybody at CUNY, and thank you for taking an hour of your day to invest in your career and job search. We want to help you, you will get through this and I would love to take all of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Do you want people to unmute and ask questions or type into the chat box? What would you prefer? Um, I'll let you make that decision, Fred. Okay, if you want to ask a question, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask Lindsay a question. I know there's a lot of questions that are in the chat box that may have not been answered, so please feel free to re-ask those again. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. No? Tell us your name. Um, I'm Ray. Um, I'm a junior at Baruch. Uh, thanks for doing this. It's really helpful. Uh, I wanted to ask, yeah, I've tried. So thank you for the messages uh, to reach out on LinkedIn. I think it's really helpful to know what's the best way to reach out to people. The only thing is that um, I've, uh, I got to a barrier where LinkedIn has the character limit and it's hard for me to get that great message into that character limit and what would you suggest to do about that? Thank you, Ray, for being our first guinea pig asking a question that went very smoothly. Um, okay, I wanna shift your thinking and reframe it. I actually want you to see that character limit as a gift because most people hate long emails and they really don't wanna read it. So I think it's gonna force you to be concise in your networking request and you should embrace that need to be short. So I actually specifically formatted my message to fit into that character count. I think it does, you should double check that. Um, but I would keep it really, really short. Remember, all you want is for someone to agree to talk to you. You don't have to tell them your life story. So be really concise, really positive. Think of it more as a sales pitch than a networking email. And I think sticking to that limit will actually serve you well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Hi, hi um, can you hear me? Yes, who's this? Uh, this is Kwame um, from Baruch. I'm part of the MPA program. Hi. Um, hi, I had just recently got out an internship with the Department of Health and Mental Hy um, Hygiene through, uh, through HRTP. But uh, before I got my start date, you know, the whole COVID situation started. So. I mean, I got hired, I did the paperwork and the fingerprint and everything, but I was just waiting for my start date. And I still haven't heard from them. I sent out emails, but you know, nobody's getting back to me. So what do you suggest I do? Do I keep sending emails or? Thank you, Kwame. First, congratulations on getting the job. Let's just take a moment to be happy that you have an offer. Um, I have a couple of strategies. I would not keep emailing because that's only one method. I think you need to try a couple of different methods. So number one, send one more email. Number two, wherever you got the job. So if it was through your career center, whether it was through a networking connection, if you have any other third party that you can go through to check on this for you, I would absolutely do it. So did you find the job through your career center or did you directly apply? Uh, I, I did find the job through career center and I directly applied online. Okay, so get in touch. Number one, resend the email. Number two, get in touch with your career center because they might be able to intervene and ask on your behalf. Number three, I would try an additional method. So if you have the phone number of somebody, if you have the email address of somebody else you met through your interview process, don't keep going down the same door, right? I want you to find different possibilities to get into and find out that information. It may be that the person who you 
uh, we're going to start with got laid off. It may be that they're just ridiculously busy right now and have 9,000 emails in their account and haven't given it some thought. So I want you to pretend that you're trying to get into a house and you're going to try every door and window possible to get in there. So career center, phone calls, any other connection you have and resending the email are all the strategies I would take. If you try that for a couple weeks, I would have a conversation with your career center and say, do you think I should look for other opportunities? And Fred, I'd love you to weigh in on that if you've had any similar situations at Zicklin. Yeah, um, I would definitely encourage, he's, he's not a Zicklin student, but I would go to your respective career center and talk to your career advisor, and maybe we have a contact that we could help you um, as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Kwame, good luck. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, can everyone, uh, can, can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Uh, first things first, I would just like to thank uh, the co-hosts uh, for this uh, event, um, Lindsay. Um, uh, I, I would like to thank you as well, Lindsay. Thank um, you. My and, pleasure. Uh, you're welcome. And so the question I want to ask is, um, you were uh you were discussing Twitter before uh, as a means of just finding out information and researching. Um, and I was actually wondering, um, so let's say you follow, you know, let's say you go into auditing or accounting and you follow EY. Um, is it uh, all right, appropriate if you were to investigate who that company was following or who was following them to see uh, if there was any other entities or people that you could follow as well, it, it, you know, like, um, is that appropriate to do? Yes, yes, yes. So I call this going down the rabbit hole. So let's say EY, as you said, is an example, the accounting and consulting firm. I would then look at who EY follows. And then I would go down their list and click follow, follow, follow to anything there that's interesting. Then I would look at who those companies follow. And then I would go down that list. And then I would go who those companies follow. And then I would look at who EY's competitors are and I would follow all of those. So that is exactly the strategy. You know, it's really interesting. My first job out of grad school, this is before 9-11, um, it was in the dot-com boom in the 90s. And I really wanted to work for a website that focused on women. There were two that were really famous, women.com and iVillage. And those are the only two I had heard of. So, and this was pre-Twitter, so I didn't have that opportunity, but I started learning about women.com and iVillage, and this is going to date me, some of you may understand, but I had to go to the public library to research women.com and iVillage. Raise your hand if you remember going to the public library to do research. Thank you. Thank you, Diane Schultz. And what I found in an article in my search was that Business Week wrote an article and said, women.com and iVillage are the leaders, but a new startup called workingwoman.com has just started and I called their HR department and applied for a job. So I had only heard of two, but once I started reading about them, I learned about the company where I ultimately got a job. So that's exactly the strategy that you want to follow. So thank you for the question. Great thinking. Oh, uh, you're welcome. I actually had one last uh, minor question actually about, okay. uh, I was wondering um, what's, uh, do you think you could uh, send the PowerPoint upon request and what would be the best way to do that? Yep, uh, Fred, Lindsay, how is that gonna get to people? We have a list of all the registrants and we will go ahead and forward the copy of the presentation right after the program today. Perfect, thank you so, thank you very much. No, really, thank you, thank uh, you. you. On this. By the way, whoever asks the next question, I want you to put your camera on so I can see your face. If you, if you feel up for it, I would love to see your face. Hi, I'm Deborah, can, can everyone hear me? Yep. Great. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Lindsay, for taking the time to guide us and acknowledge the challenges. Um, what would be guidelines for following up with an employer, either like that we were all set to have an interview and then when things happen, they sort of cancel? because of the circumstances or like we spoke and they were interested but were unable to hire. What are some guidelines for following up with them? When, what should we say? I totally get the question. Thank you, Deborah. And I really like your fancy mansion background. So oh, huh, props, huh. props for your official Zoom background. I wanna know how to get one of those. Thank um, you. You're welcome. I just have the fake flowers over here. Okay, so. 
this is why your situation is so annoying and awful because you were probably having great success with people and then suddenly it fell apart. So number one, we have to kind of get over the emotion of that. And this happened to me. I had speaking gigs and book sales all ready to go, like on the docket, and then they fell away. And you have to realize everybody's struggling right now. So I think just sort of saying this stinks, it's awful, but it's out of my control and sort of getting past the frustration is a really good first step that a lot of people are struggling. The people you were interviewing with might not have jobs anymore, right? So to sort of know it's not personal, which I think is really important. The next thing I would say is this is why your really big list is important, right? So you might have people who you were already in contact with Loving the guy with the, the, the doll over there, the, the puppy. Anyway, <laughs> whoever you are, I appreciate the puppy. Okay, so I can't concentrate with all these faces. Okay, I'm on, I'm back, Debra. Okay, so your really big list. Include on that the people that you were already in contact with because let's say you were talking to ABC company to one person, they might not still be there, but there might be somebody else at the company who could talk to you. So look on LinkedIn. If you know anybody else at the company, if you can get in touch with HR and say, hey, I know things are tough, but I was having really good conversations with so-and-so, is there an opportunity to connect about any opportunities now or in the future? So I wouldn't completely forget about them, but I would know that maybe it's just not the right timing, but it might be in a week or two. The other funny thing about this situation is things are changing so incredibly quickly that a company that might've been ignoring you a week ago could be very ready to talk in two weeks. So I would say, keep them on your list. But then I would use the Twitter strategy and the really big list strategy. So would you be able to tell me what industry these companies were in, even just basically? Uh, um, I would say like, Maybe e-learning? Okay, so e-learning. You could say, these companies were in e-learning. Maybe I should also look at higher education. Maybe I should look at K-12 education. I should look for education technology companies. I should look for marketing companies who have clients. And this is where you can go on Twitter and look at every one of those e-learning companies. Maybe it's Coursera, maybe it's um, edX, maybe it's LinkedIn Learning and say, okay, who do they follow? Who are the PR companies who support them? Who are the technology companies that make the technology that support those companies? And so you can go down that rabbit hole. So I would continue to try to talk to the people using the strategy that we talked about earlier, where you try to go in through different doors and say, I'm still really interested. I'm still here. Because by the way, most people are never going to go back. If you are persistent and they start hiring again, I want you at the front of the line. And that might be in two months, but I want you there. So don't let it go. Don't bombard them, but you know, maybe once a week, once every two weeks, check in and then start going down the rabbit hole of who else is like them. So continue what you were doing, try different doors, and then look on Twitter and LinkedIn to find other companies that are like that and know that it's not personal. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Lindsay, I have a question that came to the chat privately. Great. Um, we have a student who's an older student, say in his early 40s, and he has questions about how do you compete with younger students and younger graduate students. Can you shed some light based on your experience working with multi-generations in the workplace? I know that at CUNY we have a variety of students that come back to school regardless of their age to better themselves and get an education. Could you share some advice and techniques and tips for students that might be older than traditional 18 to 21 year old students? So I'm going to get over my irritation with you for calling 40s older because I'm 45, but like, okay, <laughs> let's like set that aside, my friend, and move on. <clears throat> um, okay, so yes, we are a little bit older than traditional student. Here's the thing. Don't think about anyone but yourself. I've had so many people reach out to me and say, but I'm in my 40s. I'm competing with people in their 20s. Don't think about the competition. Just think about what you can offer. So number one, this is where your network come in, comes into play. If you're in your 40s, you might have a bigger network than somebody in their 20s. You've had more time to meet people. Don't ever apologize for your age. I worked on a study about people who are older in the workplace up through their 60s, 70s, 80s. More often than not, the employers were not thinking about the applicant's age until the applicant said, I know I'm an older applicant or you probably don't wanna to talk to me because I'm in my 50s. So don't draw attention to it if somebody else isn't, that's number one. Number two, if you go in through a person that you know, 
they're not thinking about your age. They're thinking about the fact that they know you. So they're not going to say, hey, Fred, I have an applicant who's 43. They're going to say, I have an applicant who I think could do a very good job. So if you apply through a person you know, you're still going to be at the top of the list from anybody who applied without having a connection. Number three, don't focus on yourself. Focus on what you can offer to the company that is likely struggling right now because every company is struggling. So rather than saying, I need a job, I have 20 years of experience, I want to do this role, say, I want to support you. I want to contribute to your mission. I want to help your company achieve its goals. I have been through tough times. I will do whatever it takes to get you to be successful. So take the, the focus off, I want to do this, I want to grow, I want to learn, and put it on, I want to support you. I want to help you. And if you are completely focused on that, your age goes into the background. Look, ageism is real. I'm not going to kid you. A lot of people are probably going to take jobs below the salary level or the um, title level that they want. Don't say, I'm willing to take a, a pay cut. I'm willing to get down. That's about you. Say, I want to contribute in any way you need in whatever role my skill set will help. So always think about it from the employer's perspective. I'm not going to say it's easy, but don't hurt yourself by drawing attention to your age if the employer is not doing that for you. Does that make sense? Yes, that's very helpful. Awesome. Thank you. And 40s are young, my friend. 40s are super young. Well said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lindsay, Lindsay Plu is managing the group chat, but a couple okay. came privately. One more, and I'm going to go back to the group chat. We have a student who just got her MBA. She has a job as a restaurant, a restaurant waitress, doesn't have work authorization. Should she include that restaurant job on her resume LinkedIn profile? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. It's work, it's customer service, it's dealing people. It shows that you're a professional, 100% yes. I, I agree. Thanks, Lindsay. Good. So oh, I'm seeing more faces. Uh, I love this. I'm seeing faces. Everybody brush their hair. Okay, good job. Not everybody, but most of us. Uh, Lindsay, great question came in um, about uh, LinkedIn. Um, and since you were a LinkedIn ambassador, um, I would love to hear your advice as well on this. Uh, Jen asks, what recommendations do you have with regard to content shared on your profile, keeping in mind this is part of building your brand? So when it comes to LinkedIn, the cold hard truth is most people are not going to read everything you post and long lists of information, right? I think shorter and more concise are better when it comes to LinkedIn. That said, keywords are really important. So I do think it's worth spending, let's say one hour of your time updating your LinkedIn profile to show the depth of your skills and experience. So if you can post a PowerPoint presentation that you worked on, do it. If you can post a video of a presentation that you gave in a class, do it. If you can post an article uh, that you wrote or a paper that you wrote for class, do it. I wouldn't worry about posting new stuff every day, but I would fill out your profile so there's enough information there for people to look at. So that's the content that you can post on LinkedIn as part of your static profile. When it comes to posting articles and LinkedIn posts kind of like in the feed, I would only do it if you are very clear on exactly what you want. My fear is if you need to broaden your search right now to multiple industries and you're only posting content about um, the transportation industry, it might limit you from an opportunity someplace else. So I think that posting content onto your profile, and you can clarify the question, Lindsay Plua, um, if they met on their profile or in the feed, I don't think updating your feed with lots of posts is all that valuable for a job seeker, but I think having content as part of your static post is very valuable. I would also say commenting on employers' posts has a lot of value. So if you're following, let's go back to the EY example, if you're following EY and Deloitte and KPMG and they're posting good content and you say, great content, um, and you post an intelligent comment on something they posted, that is a way to catch the eye of potential employers. So Lindsay, feel free to clarify if I got to the heart of that question, 
but I'm much more concerned with what's on your profile than what you're posting on a regular basis. And I want to thank the two people who have beautiful babies in the screen right now, because that is making me like super happy right now. Hi, babies. <laughs> did I get the, that question right of what they were asking? I, I believe you did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so a uh, question about cover letters. What are your thoughts? Okay, so cover letters are weird. I've asked recruiters for like 15 years about cover letters and half of recruiters say, I love them. They're more important than a resume. I wanna see your writing style. And half of recruiters say, I never read them. I throw them in the garbage. So there's no way to know. I do think that when you are emailing with a networking contact, you don't want to attach two attachments. I want you to write the cover letter as the email message and only attach your resume. So never ever have two attachments. Like don't say, hi, attach, please find a cover letter and a resume. Make the cover letter the email, number one. For the companies that do care about cover letters, if a job application says, please submit a cover letter and a resume, you have to do it. And there what's critical is that the cover letter does two things. Number one, it shows that you have done your homework on the employer. Never ever submit a generic cover letter. I would like to apply for your position at your company because these are my skills. You have to customize with a sentence or two that shows that you understand what makes that company unique. You can find that information on the company's website and on the company's social media page. So if you're applying for a job at Walmart, I would say, I know that you are being a leader during this terrible crisis, and I would love to work for a company that is serving people in this time of need, right? My skill set fills this job with XYZ keywords from the job posting, right? So make sure, number one, that you are customizing it. Number two, the other big thing that you have to do in a cover letter is show that you want to serve the company and it's about them, not about you. I would limit the number of times you use the word I in your cover letter. I don't like cover letters that say, I want to learn, I want to grow, I want to uh, you know, be part of your company. I want it to say, my skill as a writer will serve your need to reach your customers. I want to grow your bottom line. I want to help your team grow, right? So make sure, number one, that you show that you've done your homework, and number two, that you're focused on their needs, not on your own needs. And again, do not attach it. Always write it directly as the email. And again, some people make decisions based on the cover letter. Other people don't, but you have to take it as seriously as possible because you never know which kind of recruiter you're going to get. Great, thank you. Thank you um, for the question. Anastasia has a question about LinkedIn recommendations. Um, if recommenders are asking if there's anything particular you want me to focus on, uh, any advice on what makes sense to include? So LinkedIn recommendations, I think they're important enough that I want you to get to what I think they call all-star status or 100% status on LinkedIn, and that requires two recommendations. So make sure you have two. Beyond that, I would not waste your time getting LinkedIn recommendations. If a company genuinely wants to check your references, they will formally check your references. It's nice to have them on your LinkedIn profile, but if you are thinking of asking somebody for a recommendation on LinkedIn, I would rather instead that you ask them for a 15 minute phone call to actually help you with your job search. I think that's a much better ask to make right now. So take the focus off of the, the recommendation and say, instead of a recommendation, could we have a chat? I'd love to know if you know anybody who's hiring or if you'd be willing to personally email somebody you know on my behalf. The generic recommendation is not gonna be as valuable as one single email that person could send for a real job opportunity. So I know LinkedIn wants you to have them. I know they seem valuable, but trust me, I was on the inside. It's just a nice to have. I wouldn't put much energy into it as opposed to using that networking contact in other ways. Do all the career services people agree with me on that? Yep. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. So quick question from Maggie. Uh, Maggie asks, what is a good email subject line when sending out networking emails? Great question, Maggie, thank you. So do not put networking, do not put hello, do not put checking in. I want you to be specific, right? Um, 
hello and request for 15 minute conversation. If it's an alum, um, Baruch student seeking advice, anything in there that gives a genuine indication of what is to come. Uh, my favorite is to say hello and request for a conversation. Hello and request for email chat. Um, uh, uh, hunter student seeking advice, right? Be a little bit specific and honest about what it is because people don't like a bait and switch, right? If it says hello or checking in and then you're actually asking for help, I think it's irritating. So I would just be honest, specific, and detailed. Thank you. Um, so we have a few more questions. Um, let's see. So Joseph says, uh, for those of us, uh, myself included, who have a good idea about what field they want to be in, but aren't sure what job they want next, uh, are there any specific resources, books, podcasts, et cetera, um, that will help me figure out what type of jobs I really want next? You know, this, is, this really hits a nerve with me because I knew that I wanted to work in media or business or nonprofit, but I didn't know what job I wanted. That's really hard because employers expect you to know. They don't want to figure that out for you. I had one recruiter say, my job is to put a square peg in a square hole. So don't tell me I can do 73 things and you'll figure it out for me. I want you to know. So you have to know, even if it's four possibilities or seven possibilities, you have to know those job titles. So number one, you can do searches on LinkedIn by your skill set and then start to note down what jobs seem to match that skill set. Number two, you can take assessment tests through your career center. Uh, there's also one that's being offered for free right now from a company called Capfinity, Strengths Together. Strengths Together, maybe you can uh, type that into the chat, Lindsay. Strengths with an S together. They're offering their um, assessment test free so any one of those ways to find out the job title and know that some companies are different. They might call it an analyst. They might call it a project manager, but you need to make that list yourself um, and find out what those job titles are. And I know it sounds daunting and like there would be 10,000, but I bet you could limit it to like 10 titles that make sense for your skill set. So look at job listings that match your skills. And number two, try to take an assessment test. Um, Fred, do you want to weigh in from the CUNY perspective? Are there any that CUNY recommends or makes available to students across the college system? I think every school handles it differently. Our office offers the Strength Finder and the MBTI. Um, that's with working with MS MBA. Some of the undergraduate offices use different assessments. So I think it's a specific to your career center to find out what assessments are best. You can also talk to your networking connections, right? And say, hey, I want to run my skills by you. What does that sound like? It would, uh, what kind of job would that match at your company? So that's another use for your network. And I would put that on your really big list, all the different job titles that would work for you. But it's a really important question. You don't just want to say, I want to work in media and not know exactly what job you want. So I think you're right to know that that's an important element of the search. Uh, okay, so the next question um, is regarding lack of work experience. So if you don't have any work experience in a re in, um, that's related to the area you're studying and you're going to graduate soon, uh, what can you put uh, on your resume um, so that you have a shot competing with applicants that have previous experience? How do you get a job with that experience and get experience without a job? It's the classic question, <laughs> even more important now. So I want you to take the word work out of that question. How do you get any experience with the topic of the area that you want to work in? Forget about work. So let's say you want to go into, I'll use media again as an example. I want you to put on your LinkedIn profile any classes that you took related to that industry because that is experience with the subject matter. You took a class on it. And going back to the earlier question, that's where I would put an example of a paper you wrote or a presentation you gave to show that you have experience working in that field. Number two, did you belong to any clubs or associations or organizations related to your subject area? And by the way, if you didn't join one now online and put it on your LinkedIn profile, if you can take an e-course, a LinkedIn learning course, a Coursera course, a Udemy course for free, take it and put on your LinkedIn profile that you took that course. So think about all the different ways that you can get a touch point 
with that industry without actually having worked in that industry. So think about ways that you can take classes, join associations, promote any connection you have. And by the way, if you're really interested in that field, I hope you've done something related to that field and that you don't have to fake it because of course you can't lie, but you can certainly do things to show an affinity or an interest in a field, even if you've never worked in it and get those keywords all over your resume and LinkedIn profile, even if they're in the coursework section, even if they're in the volunteer section, even if they're in the extracurricular section, those words have to be there related to your industry. And if you're a college student just graduating, particularly if you're a traditional college student age, or if you're a career changer, nobody's going to expect you to have 50 years of experience. They're just going to expect that you have done something related to that field. Thank you. Totally agree. <laughs> uh, Maggie says, uh, Lindsay, there seems to be a lot of positions outside of New York City. How would you get over the hurdle of relocation? Well, now is a really interesting time, right? Because a lot of organizations are going to let you work remotely at the beginning. And if you prove yourself remotely, there might be a possibility there. Uh, I would get really serious on how far you would be willing to go. Um, when I job hunted after 9-11, I actually ended up getting a part-time role in Westchester. I lived in the city and I had to reverse commute. And you know what? It was annoying, but it was a job and I did it. So get really clear on how far would you be willing to commute. If it's an hour in any direction, then be realistic that that's okay. If an hour in any direction is not doable for you with your childcare situation or your finances or what have you, then don't look there. So I would get really honest on what you would be willing to do to get a job right now. And it might not be the ideal situation, but you know what? Taking a train for an hour a day wasn't so bad because I had a paycheck coming in and I needed it. So be really honest with yourself on what might not be ideal, but what you would be willing to do. Um, and know that if you take a job right now that's an hour away and things change and we're able to leave our apartments and our homes, you're still going to have that job and you're not going to be able to back out at that point. So be honest. Um, number two, uh, there are websites like flexjobs.com. There are a lot of websites that are promoting remote work right now. I think a lot of employers are going to realize that people can work remotely in jobs that they didn't think could be done remotely before. So I would add to your list the possibility um, of working remotely for these jobs. But I would not apply for a job in a location where you would not actually work beyond this pandemic just to make sure that you're not um, put selling, setting yourself up for a situation that could be very uncomfortable in the future. Thank you. Um, and going back to the previous question, what to do when you don't have work experience. And I think um, you mentioned, uh, I, I, I'm always not sure how to pronounce it. Udemy? Udemy? Yeah, Udemy. Yeah, Udemy. Udemy. Um, Diane Schultz also uh, recommended uh, LinkedIn Learning, um, yes. which is free for CUNY students. Great. Um, and Jack Pallara from our office at Zicklin uh, suggested that IBM is offering free courses via oh, its wow. cognitive skills platform. Very I mean, cool. I would, I would really encourage anyone who has the time and is well to take advantage of the stuff being offered for free right now that is never free. I mean, really, if you can, you're going to get access to some stuff that we would never otherwise have access to. So I think CUNY is a great clearinghouse for what those options are. I didn't know that about LinkedIn Learning being free. That's fantastic. But don't look back and say, how did I not take advantage of that? If you have the time and the wherewithal right now, really try to make time to do some of that learning. Also, people are going to ask you, I hate to say it, and it's not fair, but people are going to say, what did you do during the pandemic? You were unemployed for three months. What did you do? I want you to have a good answer to that question. And wow, I took a free class from IBM. That's a really good answer. So think about it both from the skills you can get, but also the story you want to be able to tell about how you handled this time. We have maybe one more question. It's 126. Lindsay, okay. I can't thank you enough for staying on. We still have 80 students engaged with the Q&A. So you can take one more question from the group. I could do this all day, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, do you want to leave? I got, Go ahead. I think I got everyone. I'm not seeing any other questions, but if I missed you, feel free to unmute and ask Lindsay yourself. Um, but I think I got everyone. 
Lindsay Pollock, do you want to leave any <laughs> final thoughts? <laughs> um, yes. And, and you know, you're, you're such a good friend to CUNY and to Baruch and to Zicklin, and we can't thank you enough for your generosity today. Um, and you really know our students and our population very well. And thank you for always being an advocate for us. Do you want to leave any, any final thoughts? Yes, I am with you. We are in this together. My second apartment in New York literally looked in on Baruch College. So I like saw you guys from my second apartment in New York when I was single and, and kind of trying to make a go of things. Um, here's what I want to say. You are going to get through this. We all are. This will make you stronger and more resilient and better for the rest of your career. It is awful right now but the resilience that you will have moving forward in your career will be extraordinary and i want you to think of yourself kind of as a warrior right now that what you are doing and what you are building is going to support you for the rest of your entire career you are not alone i'm not kidding when i say to email me and send me linkedin requests um, go to your career services office tap into the people who want to help you being part of cuny is being part of an extraordinary community and you have that and a lot of people don't so i'm with you we're all with you hang in there um, you know if you don't hear from me it means my face is in a bowl of m m so like i'm gonna be okay but um, I'm with you and I'm so glad to see your faces and I hope this has provided some help and support. So thank you. A huge thank you to Lindsay Pollock for your time. A huge thank you to Lindsay Plua, both Lindsay P's, <laughs> for, for monitoring the chat. And Lindsay Pollock, I know you're very generous and students who do reach out, you do respond. So please feel free to connect with Lindsay Pollock via LinkedIn or over email. She is very happy to respond to your questions afterwards. Lindsay Pollock, a huge heartfelt thanks once again for your time and an amazing presentation. We're so grateful that you're able to do this for us today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Keep in touch, okay? Have a good afternoon, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much.